Hi, I'm Tina Desiree Berg. I'm here in Atlanta on the ground reporting at Cop City Week of Action. Today we are at the Hip Hop Caucus. They're about to do a town hall this evening, but I'm speaking with Marsha that is with the Hip Hop Caucus on some of the issues that are surrounding Cop City, some of the narratives that are probably false, and some of the concerns that the community might have. Welcome. I'm so glad to talk to you, Marsha. Right off the top, there's been this ridiculous narrative that Cop City uh, agitators are all from outside of the state, that it's not a diverse group. Um, you, you've heard this stuff as well as I have. I've been here a couple times now and I, I, I'm seeing the opposite is true. So what are your thoughts on that narrative? Well, clearly, um, as a um, black woman from Georgia, um, that narrative is com completely false. Um, yes. Early on in this fight, you were seeing a lot of non-black faces just off of, of the events that occurred earlier this year. You know, typically when you're you're dealing with forest defenders and, and what occurred in that situation, that's not what you're going to see a lot a lot of black faces on. However, it does not change the fact and what is the, the issue and how this impacts the black community is whenever you're talking about militarization of police or over um, policing yeah. it is very predatory in nature and it always impacts black and brown communities you see and so one piece that a lot of people just aren't putting together is you're hearing two big things and there were two professors from Emory that did a poll on this and that is um, Buckhead becoming a city right. okay and the Atlanta training um, facility that we we now are calling Cop City. And so these things are occurring at the same time. And so whenever you see these types of things occurring, you have to raise the question and ask yourself, okay, why are they supporting this? Because if Buckhead, according to that poll, you had more white residents that lived in Buckhead that support Cop City, if they support it so, place it on West Paces Ferry. Don't place it down the street from McNair High School. You know what, let's talk about this for a second. Buckhead County, for folks that aren't clear on this, this is a wealthier suburb of Atlanta. Um, two things are going on there. Not only is it a wealthy suburb, obviously they supply a large tax base to the city. So the city council, I think, is uh, concerned about losing that tax base. But there was a referendum or a movement, I should say, for Buckhead to leave. Um, oh, <laughs> somebody's trying to come out the door right now. <laughs> There was a movement for Buckhead County to become a separate entity, and it was being it was being forwarded by a white Trump supporter. Let's be clear on that. So there's multiple levels to this, but I think also added to that is Buckhead County being a wealthy community. They want Cop City. They want to protect their wealth, but they want to place this in an area that's in the South where they're not going to be affected by this. And I think there is an an, an element of environmental racism to it, right? So that the, the the, the parts of the city that are in the south are mainly black and brown communities. Obviously, if you take all that forest away, the flooding that happens down there already is going to be much worse. Um, and I also think the fact that you have um, you know, parts of that area that are unincorporated DeKalb County, and I think this matters because those folks don't have a say on the city council. They're unincorporated from the city, yet the city council is deciding their fate. So a little history behind that. So Buckhead wants to become a city. It is a part of Fulton County, okay. but it wants to become a city. Okay. And so the area where Cop City is um, going to be built, that is in an in a incorporated area of South DeKalb. I'm very familiar with that area. Um, so we can debunk that myth that we were talking about earlier because I'm actually a graduate of Southwest DeKalb High right School. On. Um, which we were rivals with McNair High School, love McNair, um, where this site is going to be. So just want to share a story with you. The first time that I decided to go down that street, um, my son attend, attended the same school, Southwest DeKalb. And so as we were riding down the site, my son said, oh, mama, this is where they're going to build Cop City? I said, yes. He said, it's right down the street from McNair. It's in a black neighborhood. He said, everything I saw on the news, I thought it was in a white neighborhood, you see. And yeah. so the flip side to it is if you go on the other side, that's where a lot of gentrification is occurring in South DeKalb, okay? And so whenever you have this gentrification occurring, there seems to be this narrative of, you know, hey, we need more police, or whenever gentrification occurs, 
you what ends up happening you you see people attending meetings and they're like hey people are breaking in my cars people are breaking in my home but you have commandeered their area you see um, now you know you're, you're 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 sending out you know information and, and you're, you're you're impacting generational wealth you see that could occur you you know, let's talk about that generational wealth so there is an income inequality gap that exists we all know that but there's a wealth inequality gap that exists and that's rarely discussed and I think this is a, an important metric because if you have families that have been redlined they weren't able to buy houses whereas a lot of white families were able to buy houses they they paid the house off they handed the house down to the kids uh, and a lot of black folks didn't have those opportunities in the 50s and 60s and there there is that has never been sort of rectified or dealt with no. and it's it, it's it's a huge gap so now added to that you have you know these families coming in and gentrifying the area they have more money because they you know had family wealth or whatever and they just want to protect their capital at this point at all costs Maybe the better idea is, I'm just going to throw this out here, maybe the idea is to address the income inequality and the wealth inequality because most of these crimes are being, uh, they're being committed because of poverty and, and having more cops on the street isn't necessarily going to correct that problem. And I'm glad you brought that up um, because that's something that, you know, we speak on as far in, instead of um, focusing and spending all of this millions of dollars, almost 90 million on training police because we're not discussing, yes, I understand that they have some ordinances that they're going to do some racial bias training. However, um, just was that a golf clap? <laughs> for, for, for doing that, for, you know, that's, that's something you're going to have to commit to that every day. Okay. But the way it works and when you're dealing in a capitalist society is that if people don't have jobs, if they're concerned about how they're going to eat, when their stomach starts to touch their back, people are going to make decisions that's not going to always be in the best interest of everyone else because it's self-preservation, it's survival at this point in time. And so what we're seeing um, is just like you said, people are committing quote unquote crimes because they're trying to figure out how they're going to pay their bills, okay? Um, you also have people dealing with mental health situations, you see, and the police are not trained to deal with those things. So apply the money there, okay? We can't continue training police officers to escalate and confront an issue. Police officers are not trained to handle mental health issues. Police officers are not trained to have that compassion in social services that they need to have. So let's apply apply the money there. Um, apply the money to homelessness that we're dealing with. Just the economic divide that we've already spoken about. Then we have to also think about the homelessness that is the underlying homelessness that is occurring due to COVID. Okay. Then we have a whole other piece here, the working poor that is being impacted, you see. But yes, when we talk about just the environmental concerns that this will have um, in South DeKalb, uh, with the the water that's there, that's all that's people. It's already an environmental um, injustice um, site as it is. So now you're going to have um, noise pollution on top of it, which has been an issue. But now you're going to have officers shooting bullets. Where are these bullets going to land? Right. They're going to land in the water. Yeah. Okay. Most times than not, whenever you test the water, you know, yeah. I, I'm just going to be honest with you. Um, None blacks have been using, not using water out the faucet for 30 years. That is just now becoming a thing in black neighborhoods within the past 10 years. You understand? Yeah. Okay. So we have a high rate of lead poisoning. You see, um, we have high rates of asthma. We already have the high rate of, of targeted utility burdens. And so it's just a lot going on, you see. But as far as Cop City and why this needs to be stopped, there has not been any data that shows that when you have a militarized police or when, when there is over policing that it actually stops the crime rate. It actually raises the rate of police violence against black and brown people. No, I think that is absolutely true. Um, another component of this that I don't think is getting enough attention that I've actually seen in action the last two days, some of the criticism coming from cop city act, uh, activists has to do with the fact that 
corporations are funding the police foundation and the corporations that are funding the police foundation they expect some sort of quid pro quo for their donation right so I we filmed yesterday an arrest in front of Home Depot there was a PR guy there from Home Depot corporate that we spoke to um, and he was really clear about the fact that he wanted the cops there and he wanted them to arrest the protesters and one of the cops kind of sort of said yeah we're here because Home Depot and I'm, I'm like that sort of plays into this idea that these corporations are giving you a donation and then you're at their beck and call and that's really not what policing is supposed to be about and then today earlier at Cadence Bank we, we saw a similar situation where we had bank executives out there sort of uh, threatening criminal trespass or just putting your toe on the steps so how did we get here because this is not normal policing you know I live in Los Angeles I've seen LAPD in their worst bits my cameraman lives in New York he's seen NYPD in their worst bits but I think this is a whole nother level of like whoa um, you know just when you were mentioning those corporations um, here's the irony in this um, when you talked about Eric Garner, um, Rashad Brooks, Breonna Taylor, these are the same corporations that said, oh, we are in solidarity. Oh. You know, I hadn't really thought about that, but you're right, they all put out messages they saying... Put out messages. They also um, indicated that they were going to have racial equity training and that they were against um, the prejudices that were occurring and that they were watching the world. These were not just protests in the United States in 2021. This, this happened all over the world, you understand? So now these same corporations are saying because it's not sexy anymore. Now these same corporations are saying, no, we need the police and we, we want them to be militar militarized. Now, let's really talk about what people are not piecing together. That is that just several weeks ago, the governor called a raid with the district attorney and tried to place state RICO charges, okay, against nonprofits that were supplying bun, bail bun, yeah. for protesters. So if it has risen to that level, then you have to ask yourself, okay, is there something else that they're not telling us? Yes, it sounds good when police say, hey, we're gonna be tough on crime and we need to have more police and we need to train them, but it's not lining up. So you want to use these same predatory tactics and you say, okay, we're gonna place RICO charges. We're gonna, we're gonna trump up these 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 claims that there was there was what there was money fraud laundering. and money laundering. Okay. You, just to be clear, folks, this was just an, an, a normal nonprofit. This, an IRS would be like, you put this in the wrong spot. Please correct this. This was really simple, not fraudulent, not money laundering errors that sometimes occur when you're doing nonprofit accounting. Just so yes. folks know what you're talking about. Yes. And so. To have that occur for people protesting. So now you are taking a direct hit on our right to assemble our civil rights. America is built on protesting. Had there not been protesting, then I, I wouldn't have a choice in what water fountain I, I, I could drink out of, you see. And so we need to be very concerned about what is it that they really are doing here. You see, we shouldn't want a situation where our local police are treating our citizens like they are, you know, occupying a foreign territory. Yeah. You, you, you see? And so that, that is an issue and that is a concern. Yeah. And people should be very concerned about it. So whenever you have such extreme measures like this occurring, about people protesting and speaking up and shedding light on something, then you need to be very concerned because we all know that it it is about this. It, it is about money. It is about business at the end of the day. But yes, um, that is a very big concern, and I think those corporations need to be called out. Your Home Depots, um, your Deltas that you sent out this messaging um, in response to Rashard Brooks. You sent out this messaging um, in response to Eric Garner, and now you're not holding yourselves accountable to what you said you were going to do.
Actually, this is this is astounding, astounding hypocrisy to me, and it's something I hadn't really put together be before. But you're right; they all put out these messages because, in that particular moment in time, they saw that there was a corporate brand benefit to doing that. And now that that's evaporated, they're like, "No, we need our property protected. Arrest anybody that is, you know, saying something we don't like. Get them out of here." But when you say that protest is ingrained in the American spirit, you're right. I mean, this country was founded on that. Whether or not, I mean, we can have the arguments that, you know, so much racism, so many um, economic injustices are baked, are absolutely baked into the system. But on the flip side, we have a constitution that does say all men are created equal, even though they meant white male property owners. It doesn't say that. It says all men. So there's that idea that we can make something of that, that we can work towards, a, you know, an egalitarian system. And right now we're moving in the opposite direction, right? And, uh, you know, the corporate aspect of that is huge because I think it's what's motivating all of this, including city council, right? So I want to talk about this for a second because there's obviously some corporate, uh, you know, graft quid pro quo happening between these corporations and the city council members. You have overwhelming response from the public saying, we don't want this thing. It's been at multiple city council meetings. Uh, petitions, you know, we now have a referendum that's been put on the ballot for November if they get the 70,000 signatures, like, it's overwhelming. Yet you have a city council that's failing to listen to that, you have a mayor that's failing to listen to that, and it's not just the Republicans, the city council is entirely um, composed of Democrats. How do people wrap their brains around that if they sort of have this idea that, that the, um, the Democratic Party isn't fascist, the Republicans are? Yes. Well. What I think, you know, needs to be noted here when we're talking about the city of election, we're talking about we're talking about seats that are nonpartisan, you see. And so I think that's where there isn't a lot of clarity um, with people, you see. When it comes to, you know, because they're going to say that policing is nonpartisan, okay? They're going to say, you know, in some circles that environmental injustices are nonpartisan, you see. Um, so it, it, it's, it's not alarming, you know, when you, you understand it. And so much has already been placed at the table to get this ball rolling, you see. So when you have a, a police foundation like the Atlanta Police Foundation that two years ago was, was like in the bottom 20 of police foundations in the United States, then this comes up in Atlanta, Georgia with their Atlanta Police Foundation, and now they're in the top 10, all of a sudden in, in, in nonprofit funding and, and funding that they're getting, you see? And so it's a lot of people that want this to happen, you see? And so we just have to ring the alarm about it, you know? And that's why we're having this event um, here this evening, the Hip Hop Caucus, so we can speak to our demographic, the hip hop community, you see, and make it make sense. Make, um, speak to them on their level so that that light bulb will go off because we have so many other ailments and things that we're dealing with that it's just not, it's just not clicking in, you see. But there's no way that anyone can think that over-policing is, is safe. Over-policing and militarization of local police, that shouldn't even come in the same sentence, you see. You know, we have the military, we have the United States military to handle military. We have the Coast Guard, to ha I mean, you know, we have a National Guard to handle those things on the state level. But our local police, um, I just want to go back to what you were saying, just being from California and things that you've noticed here. This is why we have this on here. This is the Dirty South. This is, this is the home of America's apartheid, also known as Jim Crow. So things are going to be very different here than they are in other places, you, you understand. And so this is why we need to have these conversations, especially in a place like Atlanta, where Atlanta has stood unbossed and unbought, and we need to make sure that that continues to occur. Yes. Marcia, I want to thank you for talking to us. You have just enlighten so many people, whether you know it or not, with what you're saying. Um, we're looking forward to covering the Hip Hop Caucus tonight. Um, thanks for watching.